This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. What if comparing car insurance rates was as easy as putting on your favorite podcast? With Progressive, it is. Just visit the Progressive website to quote with all the coverages you want. You'll see Progressive's direct rate, and then their tool will provide options from other companies so you can compare. All you need to do is choose the rate and coverage you like. Quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Kate, how much Nickelodeon did you watch growing up? Growing up, I definitely watched Nickelodeon. I was more of a Disney kid personally, but I... I like how you're like, those are the two genders. <laughs> the two genders. There's the Disney kids versus the Nickelodeon kids. And the Nickelodeon kids were cool, and I wasn't that <laughs> cool. <laughs> Kate Taylor is a reporter at Business Insider. And the Nickelodeon she grew up with was the cable behemoth of the early 2000s. Where's Amanda? Um, the Amanda Show will begin momentarily. Um, it was home to major hits like The Amanda Show with Amanda Bynes. We Amanda! Fresh out the box. Stop. And then there was Look All That. Watch. Ready yet? Get set. It's All That. All That was a sketch comedy show for tweens. Did you feel like there were rules in the Nickelodeon world? In the Nickelodeon world, there were really no rules. It was something where there are no parents, no rules, can do basically whatever you want. Over the last couple of years, Kate's reporting has revealed just how few rules there have been at Nickelodeon. She's revealed that women writers were underpaid and sexually harassed. She's shown how one of the company's top showrunners was known for his temper behind the scenes and his sexualization of girls once the cameras were on. And then, just this month, Kate helped convince one of Nickelodeon's young stars to come forward with explosive allegations of sexual abuse in the documentary Quiet on Set. I asked Kate what it was like gathering this evidence week after week, year after year. It has been really interesting because I think that I have been talking to people about this for years and the tone that people took, even from 2022 to now, has really evolved where before I published my first article, a lot of child actors were kind of either very worried about stepping forward or very much wanted to say my current success outweighs any concerns I had at the time. And now things look very different. Now in this new documentary, it's called Quiet on the Set, some former child actors are talking about the toxic environment and sexual abuse they faced when they worked at Nickelodeon. Multiple former child actors have spoken out in the documentary, including actor Drake Bell, who says... Are you able to watch the television of your youth now? I do have a hard time watching it, where when you know what people are dealing with behind the scenes, it takes on a different tone. These are people who are being forced to do things by adults with power over them. And it goes from when you're a kid, you're like, wow, I wish I could live that life. That seems so fun to watching as an adult and being like, what sane adult would put kids in a situation where they feel unsafe like this? Today on the show, Nickelodeon broke ground when it came to kids' TV. But at what cost? I'm Mary Harris. You're listening to What Next. Stick around. This episode is brought to you by Discover. 
When it comes to your finances, Discover wants you to know they are the credit card that is always there for you. With 24-7 U.S.-based live customer service, everyone has the option to talk to a real person anytime, day or night. Yep, that means no more waiting for, quote, normal business hours just to get a hold of someone. We are talking real service from real people whenever you need it. Get the customer service you deserve with Discover. Limitations apply. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. This episode is brought to you by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI will not help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, or identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, or automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations. So you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real world results. That's SAP Business AI. Kate's reporting starts with an infamous Nickelodeon creator named Dan Schneider. The New York Times called him the Norman Lear of kids' television. He got his start as a teen actor himself, a goofy high school student in an 80s sitcom called Head of the Class. New from Fillmore Records and Tapes. Yes, for $29.95. $29.95. All this can be yours. You get this fabulous collection of 10. That's right, 10 of the most all-time boring students doing their dullest hits. Remember... Schneider then pivoted to writing. He joined Nickelodeon for the sketch comedy show All That. What makes it really fun for me working with young people is that it's fresh and new to them. This is often their first or second job. Fame is new, the whole process is new, and they're excited to be a part of it. There were signs back then that Schneider could be a domineering presence. But Kate says things took a turn after he leveraged his success writing for all that to create his own shows, starting with The Amanda Show, starring Amanda Bynes. We heard from writers who worked on the show that behind the scenes, Schneider was just incredibly difficult to work with in a way that was sexist, it was toxic. Uh, Throughout all of his shows, we heard from people that he would make people who are working on a set just massage him in front of everyone and usually targeting women whose jobs were to work in costuming or women writers and just expecting them to massage him in front of the entire cast and crew. Yeah, he wasn't asking the guys to do that. As far as we know, no. This was something that women were really at least disproportionately expected to do. And this led to one of the writers on The Amanda Show filing a complaint about his behavior and saying that I am facing gender discrimination at work because of these expectations to massage my boss. What happened once those allegations were made? Did the culture change? The culture did not change. These allegations were made by a writer after the first season of the first show that Dan Schneider created. And despite that happening, he was able to kind of just move through this and become more and more powerful and more and more successful. It was interesting speaking to people about this because they said, I've had a lot of bad bosses, but I would say that Schneider was probably one of the worst people that a lot of these people worked with, where I talked to writers who said, anytime I said I had worked on a Dan Schneider show, people would tell me, oh my God, I've heard so many wild stories in a way that you don't hear about every boss. But at the same time, this is part of a wider context that allows these things to happen. One of the people who I spoke with said that she hopes the reexamination of Schneider is not just about him, but that it draws attention to other toxic male bosses who have thrived in Hollywood, not just in children's entertainment, but in the industry more broadly. Yeah, it was interesting to me how the documentary sort of follows the tentacles of bad behavior spreading. Like a big part of this series isn't exactly about Dan Schneider, but about Something that happened under Dan Schneider's watch, which is one of his stars, a kid named Drake Bell. He was in a show called Drake and Josh, which is one of Dan Schneider's shows. Oh, Drake, you don't need a hot dog wearing a tuxedo. Hot dog's not wearing a tuxedo. He talks about being groomed and then repeatedly raped by a vocal coach. And it's interesting because there's no direct link to Dan Schneider himself. But it's just clear that all of this is taking place in the same universe. 
it was really interesting speaking with Drake Bell about the abuse he suffered and kind of asking him, like, where does Dan Schneider figure into this? And for him, he felt like Dan was one of the people who supported him. But on the flip side, how much can we blame Dan Schneider for creating an environment and feeding into an environment where it was normal for child actors and adults to be spending all of this time together offset? How much can we say he is responsible for not seeing the red flags with how much time uh, Drake Bell was spending with uh, the person who would go on to abuse him? Yeah. Can you tell the story as much as you can of what took place between Drake Bell and Brian Peck, the vocal coach? Because it's really upsetting. And it's upsetting because Drake Bell's father had been his manager and basically saw this vocal coach who also acted in some of the shows. He was sort of a guy who was around. He saw him and was like, this guy's trouble. And he told his son that. And he told his ex-wife that. And still, after all that, the abuse took place. I think that that's one of the most disturbing things about Drake Bell's story is that his dad did everything right in trying to raise the red flags about this, where Drake essentially met Brian Peck, this acting dialogue coach on the set of The Amanda Show. And they became close friends very quickly. His father saw this and started kind of wondering, why is this man constantly around my son? Why is he touching my son's shoulders like this? When Drake's dad, Joe Bell, brought up these concerns uh, with production, apparently, according to Joe, the father's concerns were just dismissed as him being homophobic and saying, no, like this is an appropriate relationship between a 15-year-old and a man who is in his early 40s. Um, So this leads to Brian Peck driving a wedge between Drake Bell and his father in a way that he has his father basically cut out of his life. Looking back now, Drake says, this feels like this was intentional. This feels like he was trying to isolate me from my father who had seen the red flags and wanted me to kind of not be spending as much time with this man. The abuse went on for about two years. During this entire time, Drake was working for Dan Schneider. And it's when Drake is becoming a huge star for Nickelodeon, uh, which really is kind of this strange juxtaposition for him where he says, This was the best time of my life professionally while I was wrestling with these really, really traumatic experiences in my personal life. So he felt like he couldn't speak out about the abuse he was facing without imploding his professional career at Nickelodeon. Because we had heard from Drake that he felt that Brian Peck had this massive amount of support in Hollywood and that really powerful people were rallying behind him. Eventually, Drake does tell his mom what's going on. The police get involved. Drake is able to record Brian Peck confessing to pretty much everything. Peck goes to court, gets convicted on two charges of sexual abuse. But when it comes time for sentencing, the court gets an influx of letters of support for Peck. And in these letters, it was, Brian is such a great person. I've trusted Brian to spend time with my child. I would love to work with Brian again in Hollywood. And the people who wrote these letters are pretty big stars. You have someone like James Marsden, who was a star actor in X-Men, writing the letter and saying, this is someone who I really see as a mentor, someone who has been crucial in my career. And these were written after Brian Peck had pleaded no contest to two charges of child sex abuse. It's wild to me to see names that I recognize in these letters and to see how complimentary they are of Brian Peck and how much they are saying anything that he did wrong was not his fault. And if he did make a mistake, as a lot of them said, it was because he was tempted by the underage child in question. Um, And in a lot of the letters, they're arguing for a more lenient sentence. And a lot of them are saying pretty explicitly, Brian should be given probation instead of um, having to serve time in prison. Drake Bell, he says in the documentary, he like feels a relief of, okay, like now this guy is going to 
have to face what he did. Is that what happened, though? Did it, did accountability happen? So he is someone who has pleaded no contest. He is sentenced to 16 months in prison. And this is something that you would think this person is a registered sex offender. It would be very difficult for them to work in children's entertainment here on out. But in fact, the year after Peck was released from prison, he ended up getting work on a Disney Channel show. Yikes. How does that happen? Like, how? I don't understand. Everyone who we've reached out to for comment on it, who we've tried to talk to about it, has kind of dodged responsibility there. Two of the people who wrote letters of support for Brian Peck did work on the show as directors. Um, That's Rich and Beth Carell. But they told us they were not responsible in him being hired, despite being directors on the show and being close with him. And essentially writing in their letters that we would love to work with him in the future. Brian Peck was one of three pedophiles arrested at Nickelodeon in a short period of time, and one of two connected to Dan Schneider. But Kate says none of this appeared to impact Dan or Dan's career. Dan Schneider has said and has continued to say that he did not play a role in allowing child predators to work on these Nickelodeon shows um, where he has said, I supported Drake Bell in this. I didn't know that this could have happened with Brian Peck. And I think that even Drake has a hard time grappling with, do I blame Dan for this? Um, Dan was someone who supported me. Can I blame him for hiring this person? And I think it's very murky there. It does seem like there should have been more oversight and more accountability with Schneider and with Nickelodeon as a whole in terms of who they were hiring. Nickelodeon has said that they added more restrictions, more background checks after these three child predators were arrested. Um, so there have been some changes there, but it's, it's something that is really, really shocking to see. After the break, Dan Schneider's star continues to rise. This episode is brought to you by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI will not help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, or identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, or automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations. So you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. Shipping can make or break a sale, so optimize how you ship your orders with ShipStation. They make it easy to automate and manage orders no matter how big your business grows. And they might even be able to help reduce shipping and warehouse costs. So optimize and keep up your momentum for growth with ShipStation. Sign up for your free 60-day trial now at ShipStation.com and use the code POD. That's ShipStation.com with the code P-O-D. Kate says, one of the things that's hard to look away from in her reporting is the way Dan Schneider, this Nickelodeon producer, was able to grow his power, even as his actors were becoming more and more uncomfortable with his sense of humor. A lot of Dan's jokes, they were about debasement. Some seemed meant to mimic the kind of scenes you might see in pornography. One actress who starred in Zoe 101 with Jamie Lynn Spears told Quiet on Set that there was one scene in particular that still haunts her. In it, her character is opening up a goo pop. And the joke here is that this candy goo was going to squirt all over Jamie Lynn Spears' face. So first it was Dan roaring, laughing, and then everyone kind of giggling. We heard the boys saying, it's a shot. And I had no idea what that meant. I think that there is an argument that by sexualizing these kids, you are putting them in a situation where they are open to other harm. I think that the other idea at play here is that 
some of these kids were uncomfortable with what was happening at the time and that their discomfort was not taken into account. Where when you have kids on all that doing these dares where they are having sugar dumped down their throats, where you have them going into a pool of maggots, these are things that an adult can consent to doing on fear factor. But a kid doesn't really have the ability to consent to this in a meaningful manner and their discomfort is kind of overlooked. They can't speak out about it. I want to kind of turn back to Dan Schneider, if we can. In your documentary, 2014 is kind of a turning point for him. He gets a Kids' Choice Award from Nickelodeon. There are these scenes where actors and talent are just showering him with compliments. So tell me about that year. Was it like a peak year for him? That Dan Schneider received this Kids' Choice Award and had all of his stars kind of around him on stage saying all these great things about him. I think that that was Dan Schneider's peak because it was when he had reached a point where he was seen as the hit maker for Nickelodeon. And he was at a point where if he wanted to do something, he had the power to kind of push back against Nickelodeon if they tried to uh, not allow him to do that. I talked to someone who said that when standards would say, oh, could you change this line? Could you make this change? Schneider would just like totally ignore them, basically respond mocking that Nickelodeon would even ask him to make adjustments. So he is thriving in 2014. But that is kind of also where things start to go downhill with his shows. Uh, He had created Sam and Cat, which was starring Jeanette McCurdy and Ariana Grande. Grande, of course, now is this huge pop star. Sam and Cat was canceled in 2014, and there were allegations that there was toxic behavior on set at Sam and Cat. And to me, that is where things start to change in terms of what Schneider is allowed to do and kind of it stops being a situation where he is given unlimited power indefinitely. So how did Dan Schneider eventually get the boot at Nickelodeon? In late 2017, early 2018, there had been these online rumors about Dan Schneider. And this is when we're seeing the Me Too movement really have an impact on Hollywood. And there are these rumors online, basically, that Dan Schneider is going to be impacted by Me Too. Um, Based on my reporting, the investigation into Schneider that happened at this time was not because there was an internal whistleblower on Dan, but because the online rumors were reaching this magnitude that Nickelodeon started saying, is there something going on here? Should we be looking at this? Uh, And there is an internal investigation into Schneider's alleged behavior. And the investigation didn't find any evidence of sexual misconduct by Schneider, but it concluded that he was verbally abusive. And that results in Nickelodeon and Viacom cutting ties with Schneider in 2018. Schneider was essentially forced out because of concerns on his toxic behavior and verbal abuse. In the days since your documentary was released, Dan Schneider has released a 20-minute YouTube video as a response. What did he say? Schneider responds by saying some apologies uh, where he says that he kind of sees how people were hurt and he, watching it, looks at them and is able to acknowledge they were hurt. But in other things, he does seem to try and avoid accountability, uh, where he says, I was always supportive of Drake. Like, this is something where I was a good boss. And when Drake and I talked and he told me what had happened, I was more devastated by that than anything that ever happened to me in my career thus far. Mm. And I told him, I'm here for you. What do you need? Uh, It was an interesting interview to watch, especially because it was conducted by one of the former actors who was on iCarly, and then it was released on Dan Schneider's own YouTube page. Huh. Yeah, it sounds like you don't think Schneider is taking enough responsibility for the culture he fostered. Instead of individual acts he may have personally been involved with. I think that if Schneider was seeking to take real accountability, I think it would have been something that would have been helpful for him to participate in the documentary. Oh, yeah. You must have asked him. What did he say? He he uh, declined any opportunity to actually be interviewed about this. And to me, if you want to take real accountability, uh, you kind of have to 
speak with the people who are reporting on this or speak with at least a journalist about this as opposed to uh, one of your former actors who you clearly have a warm relationship with who has said, I am not approaching this as a journalist. I don't want to forget the kids who were at the heart of your reporting. But I wonder, after the years you've spent digging into all this, I can't really tell if any child actor who was involved with Nickelodeon during the Dan Schneider era feels like they had a positive drama-free experience. I think that it's difficult to say because I think that a lot of these child actors look back at the time and say, I wasn't personally um, traumatized. Or if I was, I don't want to kind of see it that way. One of the former actors who was on uh, Zoe 101 in a pretty minor role, Abby Wild, she posted something on Instagram and was like, think about your own high school experience where there everyone has an incident at their high school that is very dramatic, traumatizing for the people involved. Now imagine that that experience happened on a major children's TV show where you have millions of people watching you as you mature and maybe don't have the tools at the time to kind of fully conceptualize what's happening. I think that a lot of these kids look back at their time on Dan Schneider shows as this was my high school experience. And that brings both positive and negative times. It brings most positive and negative memories. You know, I don't think of Nickelodeon as a very dominant force in entertainment these days. But I'm not sure if... Nickelodeon's decline is making kids safer? Like, I feel like I can point to any number of truly horrific things that have happened to kid entertainers in recent years. Like, there was just a YouTuber mom who was sent to prison. She was starving her kids, and it was part of, like, the content discipline. What does that mean for the wider lessons of your documentary and accountability? I think that some people have watched the documentary and really, really focused on Dan Schneider as this individual villain. And to me, this is a documentary that I want people to watch and think, how can we prevent something like this being made in 20 years about child influencers, children of YouTubers? I hope that it raises questions about wider accountability and wider systems that should be put in place. I... I'm not 100% sure on all the solutions, but to me, I think that anyone who is monetizing content that involves a kid needs to be really, really aware of that, whether it is a parent or whether it is a corporation. Thinking about how these kids become almost financial bargaining chips, to me, is the point where the exploitation becomes difficult to avoid. Kate, I'm really grateful for you joining the show. Thanks for coming on. Yes, thank you so much. It was great talking with you. Kate Taylor is a senior correspondent for Business Insider. And that's our show. If you're a fan of what we're doing here at What Next, the best way to support our work is to join Slate Plus. Go on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus to sign up. What Next is produced by Paige Osborne, Alina Schwartz, Rob Gunther, Anna Phillips, and Madeline Ducharme. We are led by Alicia Montgomery with a little boost from Susan Matthews. Ben Richmond is the Senior Director of Podcast Operations here at Slate. And I'm Mary Harris. You can go track me down on Twitter. I'm at Mary's Desk. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you back here next time. Looks like you need a vacation. Enter the five-hour energy Where Will the Tide Take You sweepstakes. You could win a $10,000 Dream Beach vacation. Imagine jet setting off to a tropical paradise, having fun in the sun, or diving at a gorgeous reef. It's up to you. No purchase necessary. Go to 5hetide.com for official rules and to enter. That's 5hetide.com. Enter today. Ends June 30th, 2024.